Hello. My name is Joey Hensler, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending tonight's presentation. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to work of the Dole. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this, and plan an SAB-sponsored program every semester. Members of the SAB receive great opportunities to network with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy tonight's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Your attendance and feedback help shape future programming. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. And now I'd like to introduce to you Associate Director of the Dole Institute, Barbara Ballard. Thank you, Joy. And good evening and welcome to an evening with Newt Gingrich. It is an absolute pleasure to have so many of you here. We had an afternoon session with our students and it went very well and I think our students were very excited as well as those uh, in attendance as well. I would just like to remind you on the back of your program of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, the Fort Leavenworth series. And again, you've heard me say, if you have not seen that, I hope you will take advantage of that and that's tomorrow at 3 p.m. The relevance of the Magna Carta to the 21st century and that will be on Thursday, November the 29th. And this Saturday, we will have a tribute to our veterans. It's our Veterans Day program, and it's a gala with the Moonlight Serenade Orchestra Group. And they'll be dancing and just having a great time and honoring our veterans for the sacrifices they have made for our country. And if you still want to come, please call. The deadline was the 12th, but we always leave that open a few days. We have over 300 people coming, and you certainly would be welcome to join them as well. And the post-election conference, December the 6th and the 7th, where you get a chance to really hear a little bit more about what happened in the election, how it happened, pretty much so. With that, I do want to start by thanking Nancy Dwight, who's our Republican fellow, for making it possible for Newt Gingrich to be with us today. And I think many of you know quite a bit about our former Speaker of the House. But I do just want to go through a few things. New Gingrich is an American politician. He's an author and political consultant. He represented Georgia's sixth congressional district as a Republican from 1979 until his resignation in 1999. He served as the 58th Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives from 1995 to 1999, and he was a candidate for the 2012 Republican Party presidential nomination. He is well known as the architect of the contract with America that led the Republican Party to victory in 1994 by capturing the majority in the U.S. House for the first time in 40 years. He was named Time Magazine's Man of the Year, and that was in 1995. And under his leadership as Speaker of the House, Congress passed health, welfare, budget, and tax reforms. Today, Gingrich serves as a board member of the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation uh, research Foundation. He also serves with former Senator Bob Kerry as co-chair of the National Commission for Quality Long-Term Care. He was recognized internationally as an expert on world history, military issues, and international affairs. Gingrich serves as a member of the Defense Policy Board. He's the longest serving teacher of the Joint War Fighting Course for Major Generals. He is an editorial board member of the Johns Hopkins University Journal Biosecurity and Bioterrorism. As an author, Gingrich has published 23 books, including 13 fiction and nonfiction New York Times bestsellers. His novels are active history studies in the lessons of warfare, based on fictional accounts of historical warfare battles and their aftermaths. Additionally, I think many of you know, Gingrich and his wife, Callista, host and produce historical public policy documentaries. Copies of Callista Gingrich's most recent children's book, Land of the Pilgrim's Pride, will also be available this evening. After this program, you will have the opportunity to buy a book, 
and have it signed, especially with Speaker Gingrich's newest book, Victory at Yorktown. With that, I would say, Speaker Gingrich will be interviewed this evening by Bill Lacey, director of the Dole Institute. And what they'll talk about, among other things, would be presidential, the presidential candidate, the race, the outcome of the recent presidential election, and of course they will cover his new book, Victory at Yorktown. With that, we always give people at the Dole Institute a warm Jayhawk welcome. So with the speaker, Newt Gingrich and Bill Lacey come forward to a warm applause. So you got seated. Thank you all very much for coming out tonight. It's great to have such a huge crowd. I just told the speaker that we've got the Simons Media Room filled up too and people are watching in there on, uh, on TV. So uh, an outstanding crowd. Mr. Speaker, welcome back to the Dole Institute and KU. I'm glad to be back here. It's always fun. Uh, there was an election last week. Some of us uh, were a little bit surprised by what happens. Would you say that you were a little bit surprised at the outcome? Yeah, I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, I, I did uh, the Colbert show last night and I told his uh, producer beforehand that I wanted to go in because Colbert tends to be a little bit outrageous. And I wanted to go in and I wanted to pretend that I was a Republican in denial and just say, what election? I don't, I didn't see an election. I don't know why you're talking about it. She, she said that would distinctly not work. It would just, the show would spin out of control at that point. <laughs> but uh, I, I, you know, the fact is I thought we would win. Uh, I said so publicly. I thought we'd win decisively. Uh, Michael Barone, who I respect as much as anybody who analyzes politics, thought we'd win by about the same margin I did. Uh, Karl Rove thought we'd win by a narrower margin. Uh, and I wrote a paper for Politico this week that said, you know, we need to stop. It's kind of funny talking about Republicans, but there's an elephant in the room. We have lost five of the last six presidential elections because the truth is, Gore got a plurality of the vote in, 19, in 2000. So the only time we've, come, we've gotten a majority was Bush's re-election. And for an incumbent president, that was a relatively weak majority. And so there's something, I think, very sobering about where we are right now. But equally sobering is the gap between where we thought we would be and where we are. And I talked to one of the very, most senior people in the Romney campaign, and they said, uh, with enormous sadness and, and almost depression yesterday, they literally went into, this person went into election evening thinking they would win. And uh, Cliss and I had the same experience. We, we joined in a call on uh, early uh, absent, uh, the, the exit polling about 5.30, and the numbers were so stunning that we both just looked at each other after the call was over and we were just, I mean, the gap was so big between what we thought would happen and what happened that I think it requires the Republican Party to stop, do really serious analysis, and really think deeply about where we find ourselves. When you look at the results, what are the things that stand out most stunningly to you? Well, I mean, if you had said to me that Mitt Romney would get fewer votes than John McCain, I would have thought that was impossible. Uh, if you would tell me that um, we'd end up with a net loss in the Senate races. I would have thought that was impossible. If you would suggest to me that not only would Romney lose Latinos by, with 71% for Obama, but he would do worse with Asian Americans than he did with Latino Americans, I would have thought that was impossible. Um, when you look at the turnout in Milwaukee County, it was 87.5% turned out to vote. That is an extraordinary achievement. It's not, I mean, this is what we've got to come to grips with. We're a little bit like an, an athletic team that is a <clears throat> generation out of sequ sequence in recruiting, training, strategy, practice, and it all shows on the floor. 
And there's a point where the Alumni Association has to say to the coach, you know, you either need to learn to play this game or you need to leave so we can hire somebody who can play this game. And I think we're really, this is not a Romney problem. This is a very deep Republican institutional cultural problem. Effectively, in this campaign, didn't the president really defy what we would normally consider political gravity? I mean, he won in one of the worst economies the president's ever been reelected in. He turned out voters, his vote, despite having supposedly the intensity on the other side. Yeah, that's why I'm so stunned. I mean, every model I knew of said you can't have the worst economy in modern times. You can't have gasoline dramatically more expensive. You can't have the mess in Benghazi. You can't have the largest increase in the national debt and turn around and win the election. I mean, I was confident until 5.30 on Tuesday, which is a, it's a little bit like driving a car 100 miles an hour and hitting a wall. I mean, you, you have a really sudden sense of deceleration. <laughs> have you seen any good explanations of where that you mentioned before that uh, Governor Romney wound up with about two million votes less than Senator McCain? Any sense of where no. where those votes are from? Not yet. Well, I'm, no. Now, this is part of why I wrote a paper that basically said we ought to talk less for a while and learn more. You have all these guys pontificating on television. Everybody who didn't know what was going to happen began explaining Wednesday what happened that they didn't know was going to happen. <laughs> and they have to because they've got to fill the time. But those of us who have the luxury of not filling the time where I can go and talk about George Washington and victory at Yorktown so I don't have to get trapped into this, it's useful to say as an adult, there are times you run into a problem that is big enough, you need to actually stop and learn for a while. This is that kind of problem. We, we, I don't know of any Republican in the country who understands the totality of our failure. And it's not just any one thing. It's not like, oh, gee, if you could wave a magic wand and do well with Latinos, that would solve your problem. That would certainly help. But there, there are dozens of little things. I'll, I'll give you an example. I did, uh, Clist and I, we were both launching books with what we called the American Legacy Book Tour. And Bill Fortune is going to join us as my co-author. Uh, on the no our third novel about George Washington, and Clist has written these two children's books. So we've been out doing what authors do. So we did The View on Monday, uh, which was a lot of fun. They were very nice to us. Then I did The Colbert Report last night. Neither of those shows could get Mitt Romney to come on. And they can't get most Republicans to come on. Now, there's a huge world beyond Fox News. And much of that world doesn't watch CNN or MSNBC or anything else. You know, it watches entertainment television, it watches inter interesting talk shows, it watches the Comedy Channel. People under 30 get more news from Colbert and from The Daily Show than they do from any cable network. Now, to not compete in that market, to not show up, is to put yourself at a stunning disadvantage. That would just be a, but, but there, I think there are 40 lessons like that, not two. And uh, I'm going to do a report that will be out probably by April or May that will be sort of the Gingrich report on the future of conservatism and the Republican Party. But I, in between, I'm going to have a whole group of people who are doing serious research about every aspect of campaigning. Just to follow that up, Mr. Speaker, uh, the party of Goldwater and Reagan was oriented towards limited government and individual freedom. Has our party gotten too far away from that in this uh, century? Have we allowed the government to grow, too, to grow too fast? Have we gotten involved in more things than the federal government I, needs to be involved in? I think that we've, I wouldn't put it that way. First of all, I think our governors collectively are dramatically more creative and dramatically more problem solving because uh, they get up every day and they have to make the state government work and they have to respond to crises and they have to do things. I think at the congressional and presidential level, we've gotten locked into slogans without meaning. I mean, people are for smaller government if it makes their lives better. They're for bigger government if it makes their lives better. The average person doesn't have an absolute ideological predisposition uh, if it's going to make their life worse. And so I think part of what we have to do as a party is recognize, we're, we're, I tell young people when I talk to students, the next generation has a larger challenge of innovation than any generation in American history. For us to be successful and remain the, the leading country in the world, 
the most prosperous and the freest and the safest. We have to invent over and over again. We have to reinvent education. We have to reinvent our energy industry. We have to reinvent manufacturing. We've got to fundamentally rethink government. I mean, we have a very, very old, obsolete model of how we run our governments. And they've got to be rethought. All this stuff requires thinking. But you start with, what do people really want? They really want a better life for their children and themselves and a better, safer future for their country. And they're interested in any solution which could plausibly get them there. You noted in your piece uh, published a couple days ago in Politico that we've dropped five Senate seats in the last two cycles that we definitely should have won. Do you think we lost those seats in those five states because the candidates were too conservative or because they just weren't very good candidates? I think it was more because they weren't very good candidates, but I also think it's interesting that if you have, if you have a Democrat who has a very substantial problem, I mean, if you take Elizabeth Warren, who by every account um, had fairly dramatically misidentified herself uh, in terms of her ethnic background and had actually been cited by Harvard University for a non-existent ethnic background, uh, something which, if a Republican had done it, would have discredited them and gotten them driven out of the race. In her case, after a while, it became ho-hum. I mean, people make mistakes and, you know, not being totally 100% accurate. And do you really think she got hired because she happened to claim that she was Native American? Don't you think she would have been hired anyway? And is it really wrong for Harvard? After all, nobody's really hurt by it. The difference, if, if you are a conservative in a world dominated by liberal media, you have to be much more aggressive and you have to be much more careful because you have nobody covering up for your mistakes. It's like playing a game in which the referees actually come from the other team. And you know, they, they sort of, they come out in the field and they go, hi Frank, how's your family doing? You know, I'm pretty sure you guys are gonna do fine tonight. You know, <laughs> and that's what it's like, and, and, but you have to start out and say, okay, that's reality. It's not, you know, so therefore, how do we have to operate? And I think uh, we don't do a very good job of, of preparing candidates and we allow ourselves to get put on defense in a way that almost no Democrat has ever put on defense. You commented this afternoon with the students that two contemporary presidents who've done pretty well uh, had to work with the other side in Congress, and you used President Reagan and President Clinton as an example. What, do you, what advice would you give President Obama as he starts his second term? Well, I wouldn't give him any advice because I mean, he won the election and he gets to be who he wants to be, but, but I, I would say, if asked, that he is right in the middle of making the second largest decision of his presidency. Uh, the first one was in January and February of 2009. He had given three terrific speeches uh, at Manassas in Virginia on the Saturday before the election, at Grant Park on, Saturday, on the election night, and then his inaugural address. And he was poised on the 21st of January to be a very bipartisan president and to absorb about half the Republican Party. And uh, when we left the um, inaugural, uh, I, I turned to Calista as we were leaving the Capitol and I said, if he governs based on these three speeches, he will split the Republican Party and half the party will be co-opted. In the following couple of weeks, he sat down with Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid and they said, look, we can deliver $760 billion or $780 billion in the stimulus and there's no reason letting people read it because it slows the process down. Well, if you were the Republicans and you were trying to figure out how to work with this guy and he walks in and says, you know, I'm going to run over you for $780 billion and you're not going to get any amendments, you're not going to get any hearings, in fact, you're not even going to get the bill. But I hope you understand this is just a temporary deviation and on lesser things later on when it doesn't matter, I'll be glad to be bipartisan. That poisoned the well. And then, of course, when they lost, te they lost uh, Teddy Kennedy's seat in a special election in which health care was the issue, and they decided to ram Obamacare through rather than modify it, that further poisoned the well. So when the Republicans were elected in 2010, they said they had zero grounds for cooperation, and you had two years of very bitter deadlock. The president has to decide in the next couple of weeks. Does he want to govern from the center and consolidate his gains, but be very successful at co-opting a large number of Republicans? Or is he going to govern from the left and try to carry the country even further to the left than it already is? Now, the first indicator, and I haven't seen what he said today, 
The first indicator yesterday was that he had doubled the size of the tax increase he wanted from 800 billion to a trillion six. And he had said flatly to a group of business leaders, look, I want to raise taxes on the rich because I think, I think it's a fundamental matter of fairness. I don't care about revenue. This is not about getting money for the government. This is about some people have getting too much money. And I'm for redistribution and that's who I am. Now, that's fine. He just won an election. He's allowed to be who he is. But he, he's not going to get very many Republicans to side with him if his policy is double, you know, a trillion, six hundred billion dollars in taxes, and we have to punish successful people because we really want to be a redistributionist country. I mean, if he can pull it off, fine. But he's not. Gonna, it, it will be institutionally almost impossible for Republican leaders to collaborate with him if that's where he's going. A lot of talk in D.C. these days and across the country about this looming financial crisis. What do you think is going to happen? Um, we'll muddle through. It'll be inelegant, stupid, sloppy, kind of mildly embarrassing. You don't want to show young children. Um, <laughs> we may muddle through before January. We may muddle through in the first six months of next year. Uh, but at some point, the system will, will manage to barely get enough done that we can declare the crisis semi-over until we stumble to the next crisis. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question about campaigns, and then we're going to move on to the book and bring your co-author up in just a second or two. But we have a bipartisan crowd tonight. We have a lot of Republicans, a lot of Democrats. Now, my guess is most of the Democrats who are here tonight don't really need to be cheered up or made optimistic about anything. <laughs> but there are a number of Republicans here who are here who are wondering, you know, what do we have to be optimistic about in terms of the future of the Republican Party? Can you cover a few of the high points that you think are there? No, I, we do it in our, I've written, Bill and I have written three novels about George Washington. In our first novel, To Try Men's Souls, the American army has shrunk to 2,500 people. One third of them have no boots and are marching with their feet wrapped in burlap, leaving a trail of blood. Uh, in order to avoid the collapse of the army, he takes the desperate gamble of crossing the Delaware River at night on Christmas Day in the middle of a snowstorm with ice in the river. The password that night is victory or death, and they meant it. Uh, they march nine miles in, 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 a, night, in a huge storm, uh, surprise 800 professional German soldiers and capture them at the loss of one American. Uh, the country is excited by the victory, and within a couple of weeks, 15,000 volunteers have shown up. Our second volume is Valley Forge, <clears throat> where the Continental Congress, exhibiting the same elegance as the modern Congress, uh, manages to have 14,000 people arrive at Valley Forge uh, with one ax, because they didn't provide any of the supplies they promised. And Valley Forge is a story of enormous determined persistence, but it's also a story of a European idealist, uh, Baron von Steuben, who had been a Prussian officer, showing up and having Washington invest in him the power to train the American army. And by the end of the book, for the very first time, you have a Continental Army capable of standing up, fighting the British, and beating them. Our third volume, Yorktown, is an exhausted country, six years of war. Washington can't capture New York City. The Royal Navy protects it. The French are sitting in Rhode Island. There's a French fleet in the Caribbean. Washington takes one-third of his army and sends it to the south to attack Cornwallis and weaken him. Cornwallis ends up retreating to Yorktown on a peninsula. And Washington takes the daring decision to bring the French from Rhode Island, mask the British so they don't know what's going on, seize several days' march on them. March, remember, these, these are no helicopters, no airplanes, no trucks. They are marching and pulling artillery pieces through New Jersey to Philadelphia and then south to Virginia. He doesn't know if the French fleet will arrive. He doesn't know if the British fleet will arrive first and, and rescue Cornwallis. The whole war could collapse. But he knows they have to do something. It's a great, I, I've always thought it was wonderful symbol, symbolism that when Cornwallis does surrender, the band played, the world turned upside down. Now, the reason I tell you that story is we wrote these three to say to the American people, you want hard? Try marching nine miles in the snow with no boots. I mean, you want desperation? Cross the Delaware in the middle of the night in a snowstorm with the ice and have as your password victory or death and literally mean victory or death. 
We have problems. We're the greatest country in the history of the world. We're the most extraordinary people in, in history. You can come from anywhere on this planet and learn to be an American. So we've got to sort some things out. The Republicans have a peculiar set of problems. We're going to test how deliberately obtuse we can be and whether we can actually avoid learning or whether we think that we can subordinate ourselves to facts and revitalize the party. But that's a Republican problem. It's not an American problem. And if the Republicans succeed in it, I suspect that we will come roaring back with enormous speed and that the country will move forward. But I, I fully expect us to be here long after Barack Obama, and I fully expect our grandchildren to live in the most extraordinary country in the world. That's a great way to move to bringing Bill up on stage. We, we found out just a few uh, days ago, we had hoped this was going to work out, but we found out just a few days ago that Bill Forston, who is the speaker's uh, uh, co-author, was going to be able to join us tonight. So Bill, come on up and um, we'll have you shove that uh, 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 stool back just a little bit, but please welcome Bill Forston. He's been... Thanks for joining us. Now, these gentlemen have written, is it nine historical novels together? Yes. And you started out with uh, the Civil War and then did World War II and now are finishing up your three-part series on the Revolution. Well, there's so much to cover in American history. Yeah. Talk a little bit. How did, how did you guys get together to start doing this? Um, Newt and I actually met when he was Minority Whip and um, publisher introduced us. We just seemed to hit it off. We had the same views on history. And I was working on my doctoral dissertation at the time, so I was in D.C. for a fair part of the summer. And um, things went from there. And let me add that the series we've just done on the Revolution was actually our very first project. But then the publisher suggested we move to the Civil War instead. And then four years back, right after, it was right after the election, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. When the publisher said, you know, America needs a look at George Washington as a role model for a future president. Do you think you guys would like to work with this? Well, like, yeah, well, would we? Yes. So we already had the notes uh, we had put together years earlier uh, with Steve Hanser, who's our technical editor, and uh, the series went from there. Okay. Uh, tell me this. Now, this is a point of curiosity. Um, when, did, when was this book, Victory at Yorktown, when did you guys actually complete the manuscript? Technical, that's a good question. Uh, day before it was published. <laughs> <laughs> Late night phone calls. Uh, we started, realized we were writing a continuum. We start with Trenton, as Newt has right. pointed out. We go to Valley Forge. We were already talking, uh, even before the Valley Forge book came out, about Yorktown. And then in between that, sandwiched in, we did a book on the Battle of the Crater, which uh, was a passionate subject for us in that it was the largest action involving African-American troops during the, the Civil War. Catastrophic failure, yet also a heroic, heartbreaking story that we felt had some applications to current situations. And it's a history we wanted to celebrate. In fact, we're working now on the idea of having a monument erected to the gallant men of the 4th Division, 9th Corps, uh, men of color who gave their lives to preserve the Union and to free their brothers and sisters in slavery. And then we went back to do Yorktown. So we worked on Yorktown, what, throughout the fall, winter, actually up to about May, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And just uh, people ask us, who does what? Uh, I'm dyslexic, so I just handle the consonants and Newt, hand, Newt handles the verbs, uh, and, and also the, uh, the vowels. Yeah. Actually, where I was going with this is, I mean, you, you did a lot of work while you were on the campaign trail. Sure. Then, well, the, 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 the virtue is, in the modern era, that you can, first of all, you can electronically communicate in real time. Uh, second, you can work on airplanes, on campaign buses, uh, in hotel rooms. I mean, it depends on, on what you're doing. We, we, we're very fortunate. Steve Hanser, who's our third partner, all three of us have PhDs in history. All three of us believe passionately that history is an important way of understanding reality and that we really want to write things that attract people to want to learn more history and to be more involved in history. And we like history, so we, 
we get a kick out of arguing about, do you do this or do you do that? How do you handle this? How do you handle that? But Bill is the primary writer because he, he just writes better than I do, uh, particularly in fictional settings. He, he can take a battle scene and bring it alive in a way that I can imitate, but I don't, I, there's, I don't have this particular knack that he has. Steve and I help design the, the structure of the whole book, think it through. We do a lot of editing. We add specific scenes. If there was going to be a political scene, I might well write that. And so if you get, for example, in the, in the Battle of the Crater, if you have Lincoln dealing in the White House with a particular problem, I play a role in that. Um, in the case of uh, the, uh, the Valley Forge book, for example, I had, I had known uh, that Washington really loved uh, the play Cato by Addison. And then we did some research and found out that actually at Valley Forge, the officers portrayed the play uh, for entertainment. And so we actually have an entire section that grew out of that. So each of us comes and brings our ideas, kicks it around. And the, and the books change a little bit as you write them. I mean, they, to some extent, you might want to comment on this, but to some extent, the, the books tell a story. And the story sometimes isn't the one you thought it would be but you have to follow the logic of the book uh, in order. Pe people, one of the things I'm fascinated with in fiction is people have to actually do what they would do in life. So if you are, um, if you're holding a cup of coffee, it's really important you put the cup down before you're seen next on the horse. <laughs> you can, and so you've got to be thinking about how do all these pieces come together and how can you tell the story in a crisp enough way that the, that the reader wants to stay with it? The reader is saying, I've got to read, and all of you have been through this, I have to read a couple more pages before I go to bed. Well, I think I'll just do a couple more pages. And then it's three in the morning. If, if we pull that off, then we've had a really great day. You're mentioning Cato, uh, which has had a major influence on you. Cato was... George Washington's favorite play it was written, one about 1750? Well, yeah, I think it's about 1740. Cato's 1750. defiance of Caesar's uh, taking of power. Finally, Cato commits suicide as an act of protest. And Newt was all into it. I didn't even know the play existed. And he kept saying, Bill, this is going to go into the book. And finally, I sit down one evening, and I read it. And I'm just like, I'm in tears. I, we had to get past the 18th century style. But it's, oh my god. And then Newt pointed out, he said, President, well, future President Washington could lip sync the entire play. Now, the only thing I can lip sync is uh, Henry V's speech at Agincourt, and that's only about 20 lines. So here, George Washington has this entire two hour play. So fiction gave us the ability to set it in a freezing, cold environment. They actually staged it in the bakery, the bakehouse, and the officers are huddled together, and Washington, with tears in his eyes, is lip syncing this moment where a man is saying, my freedom is even more important than my life. And I will lay my life down in protest against tyranny. And what a message to us as Americans today. Fiction gives us the opportunity to tell that kind of story. And so that's why- that But it's based on the real thing. Yeah, that's why you've chosen the route of fiction to express history in these three very important uh, wars. Well, I remember when I was defending my doctoral dissertation, and it was on a, it was actually on the Battle of the Crater, and the really tough guy on my, my committee said, uh, Bill, you know, given the way you write, I was expecting to hear the whine of the mini bullets and the screams of the wounded, and I said, Professor, if I couldn't footnote it, I know you'd kick me. And he was like, you're right. But, so history, unfortunately to us, is usually so dry, isn't it? But it, look at the word history story. It is the story of us. It's the story of our lives. In our blood here, I was talking to a wonderful lady this evening who was telling me about her husband who flew B-24s in World War II, put his life on the line. How many of us have blood that goes back to our ancestors who fought in the Civil War on either side, all the way back to the Revolution? Those are the stories fiction gives Newt and I and Steve a chance to, to spark life into the story. And that's the real joy of working together on this. How did you choose in these three books about the revolution to write about Trenton, Valley Forge, and then Yorktown? What was the, the thought process in choosing those three main focal points? Well, I think it's a little bit challenging, but it, it's, 
it really started with Trenton because that particular story is so Improbable. unbelievable. <laughs> There's this one, the, if, you, if you've never been to, uh, to Mount Vernon, they have a brand new education center. It's a couple years old now. A friend of ours helped put together that's about a $110 million project. And they have in there a film that is absolutely stunning of Washington meeting with his senior officers to talk about what are they going to do. And the film has a flashback to a book that I'm hoping Bill and I can write next, which is Washington as a young man with Braddock's army during the French and Indian Wars. And Washington was in a situation where he's advising, he's the senior colonial advisor to General Braddock. They get ambushed. Uh, Braddock is killed. They're in danger of falling apart. Washington, who's physically a big man for his generation, if you were playing him today, you'd use an NFL offensive uh, tackle because uh, he's physically that big for his time, is on a horse. He has two horses shot out from under him. He has four bullet holes in his coat. He helps save the army. Years later, he's at an Indian powwow, and the Indian chief says to him, God must have something important for you to do because I've personally fired at you 13 times. And we couldn't hit you. He said, all of us were trying to kill you because you were so obvious and you're so big. So they get to Trenton. The army has collapsed from um, the army that was at uh, Brooklyn. Uh, and by the time they get to Trenton, they're, they're down from 30,000 to 2,500 effectives. They sit there, and, and Washington has this idea. He says, we're going to cross the river at night. We're going to march. We're going to surprise these guys. We're going to win a victory. And all of his generals are saying to him, this is too complicated. We can't do this. And there's this great moment where Washington says, look, the army is collapsing because of lack of morale. If we do not win a victory in the next three weeks, the army will disappear by desertion. Now, when the army disappears, we will have lost the war. When we lose the war, the British are going to hang everyone in this room. So we have nothing to lose. <laughs> now, that... When you, when you hear that story, you certainly think, okay, how can you not tell this story? Hey, and let's, how many of you have actually, show of hands, how many of you have actually been to Mount Vernon to that new theater? Is that not awesome? Because Newt started mentioning it. When they get to the scene with Trenton, they suddenly, the room gets cold and it starts to snow inside the theater. And I'm like, it's snowing in here and it's cold. Um, but what I wanted to add to that is, Back when I was a student in college, I, I worked at a racetrack for horses. You know. and, and the real sucker bet was, was the trifectas, you know, where, where you bet on the win for three different races. And what was your odds? I mean, you start multiplying together. The one person in the whole place, actually, you know, a $2 bet turns into like 10000 That's the history of America in the Revolution. We got a trifecta. We had the Battle of Trenton where the odds were absolutely, completely against us, and yet we did it. We went through Valley Forge where by all of the standards of that time and even modern standards, the Army should have absolutely collapsed and said, we are going home, we quit. Think about an Army that's already been at war for two years and men are having their feet amputated because they don't have shoes. It's an amazing story. Yeah. And they stayed with it. And then at Yorktown, the same thing. The odds were, we, we tend to think of Yorktown as just like an inevitable victory. It was not. This is before any modern communication. This is before email that somebody can intercept and read that you don't want. But I'm not saying anything. Uh, it's, it's, it's before phones, radios, or anything. The French send a message to us by a courier boat. They don't even know if we, if we got the message. Oh, we're going to be off Chesapeake Bay for several weeks. If you can move your army, there's no communication between the French and Washington, and it all came together. That, America won a trifecta. Now, to me, person with faith, if that was not the hand of God, please somebody explain to me how we did it. And now I want to add to that, just, just to understand why this is a great partnership. So we, we pick these to do, and as Bill said, I come up with things like Addison's Cato. 
Now you have to share with them why you were able to write so well about the crossing of the Delaware. <laughs> really? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I used to be, well, I still am a reenactor to a certain degree. Uh, I've reenacted most of my life. Um, I have a lot of friends. In fact, my friend Liz here is, you're involved with the reenactment community right here in this community, helps organize events. And I was at the Washington's Crossing the Delaware event, back the year before the bicentennial. Now, it was perfect. It actually was sleeting. Ice was coming down the river. And I get emotional about it. I'll tell the emotional moment first. I get there before dawn. I'm really hung up on being authentic. So I am barefoot, in rags, blanket wrapped around me, because I didn't like all this dry, clean look. I will never forget the moment of an officer coming up to us, and we're shivering by a fire, and he says, attention to orders, by order of His Excellency General George Washington, I'm to read you the following. And he unrolls an old, an actual style galley proof, and he says, The American Crisis, by Thomas Paine. These are the times that tried men's souls. We wept. We absolutely wept. We got on the boats. We get across the river. I got George. <laughs> I'm a young rifleman. I'm the guy, you see in the painting, like this. And we ram up onto a sandbar 30 feet offshore. <laughs> and George is like standing there. Now, this is national news this day because big interest of the bison. All the cameras are on. And George is like, somebody do something. <laughs> and so one of the guys is hurling a cable across. And it's not reaching the shore. Somebody's throwing a rope back. It's not reaching the shore. So I know this will be my first chance to be on national TV. I mean, thanks to Nude, I've had opportunities since with less risk. I said, sir, I'll go. And I hand off my musket. I grab hold of the rope. And I jump into the river. No, but we're on a sandbar. I know that. It's only this deep. So I'm looking real heroic. And I take 10 steps. I get about five feet past the bow of the boat. And I go right in. There were ice flows going by, and I was up to here, floundering. And I'll tell you, if it happened to me today, I, I, I think I would have died. I, I mean, in all seriousness, I must think I would have pitched a coronary. It was like somebody had punched me in the gut. If you've ever fallen through the ice, you know what I mean. Somebody had to yank me out. I'm still holding on to the rope. We splice the cables. We get George ashore. And I'm lying on the riverbank, gasping, and I'm thinking, Suppose this was for real. There was somebody to grab me and wrap me in warm blankets and throw me in a car and turn on the heater. If it had been 1776, I would have been told, strip, there's a fire, walk around it, and then fall in and march nine miles barefoot. I will never forget that moment. It was a connection between reenacting and the harsh reality of the sacrifices that gave us our freedoms. I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, tell us, gentlemen, other than uh, Washington, who are the major characters you know, that you use to tell this story? What, Yorktown? Yes, Yorktown, yes. Gosh, well, you know, one of the things we really enjoyed working with was the tragedy of war is of course, there are two sides. Uh, there, there can be good people. There were very good people on the opposite side. I, I remember some years ago, somebody developed a test that we could hand out to you. And at the end of the test, we could tell you if would've, you would have been a loyalist, a patriot, or neutral. And a hundred, several hundred thousand Americans abandoned this country later, after the end of the war. So one of the things we, we, what we weaved in through the plot was some fictional characters who were on both sides of the struggle, who were friends before the war, came from the same village of Trenton, and now find themselves on opposite sides. Plus, we worked in all the historical characters. I mean, gosh, what a cast of characters. We had Green. We start the novel, actually, with the whole Benedict Arnold incident and the hanging of Major Andre. How many of you ever been to Westminster? in London. You've seen Major Andre's sarcophagus? What's written on it? Mourned by both friend and foe. Mourned by both friend and foe. This was a tragedy on both sides. So that's part of what we were trying to convey as well. 
Who did I miss, Newt? Well, no, obviously we have uh, DeGrasse, who is heading up oh, yeah. the French fleet. Uh, what a remarkable and, guy. And, yeah. and you have uh, the head of the French army, who is, is subservient to Washington. I mean, the French army has money. They're providing us with our uniforms. They're providing us with our ammunition. They're providing us with a fair amount of our, our arms. And yet he understands, and this is something to remember as you watch us around the planet, he understands that to be effective, he has to be Washington's subordinate. Because in the end, this has to be an American victory. And uh, it, it's Tell remarkable. him the moment about the sword. The, the, uh, the, you mean at the surrender? Yeah. Tell well, the, the British want to surrender to the French. Because after all, the, the British don't want to recognize that we beat them. And the French won't, won't permit it. Now, it's also interesting. Cornwallis will not come out to surrender. Therefore, Washington will not accept the surrender. It ends up, I think it's Lafayette, isn't it? No, it was, uh, was it Sterling or Lincoln? Not to be confused with Abraham Lincoln. No, well, I think it's Lincoln. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but Lafayette's also involved in the... Lafayette's there, but the actual handing off the sword. The, is, the, so but what, so remember Washington, the, the, Washington is saying, if you're sending your subordinate, I'm sending my subordinate. And all of this stuff is going on, but it's all real. And, and Nathaniel Green, who you mentioned earlier, Green, who comes from a, a Quaker family in, uh, in Rhode Island, be becomes maybe Washington's best general, uh, is sent south er early in the book with about a third of Washington's army. And Green consistently harasses Cornwallis and, and, and ends up at, at the Battle of Guilford Cor uh, Courthouse uh, in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, and then we have a very vivid scene here where Cornwallis wins the battle, but he loses so many casualties that he says to his, his staff afterwards, two more victories like this and we will be out of the army. And, and that's part of what forces him to then go to Yorktown is that he's just, he's just getting chewed up. Every week he's losing a little bit of ground. Even, even though he can, he can dominate any one space, he can't beat us because we just fight, pull back, fight, pull back, uh, and he is consistently losing ground. So. And the part with the sword that, how many are familiar with that moment? It's the British general offers the sword of surrender to the French commander, and okay, I think there's too much uh, Francophobia in this world. We gotta remember, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the French. And if you've ever been there and you say you don't like it, well that's like going to, I don't know, you know, or, Chicago or whatever to say you've seen America. I mean, don't go just to Paris. See the rest of France. It's a beautiful country and great people. And uh, the French commander refuses and he points to Washington and he says, there, sir, is the victory of this battle, the victor of this battle. Surrender to him. And then Washington, because as Newt pointed out, it's not Cornwallis himself. He points to one of his generals who had been humiliated earlier says, you take the sword. So with all that, we think we got problems today? And it's, it's also, I guess the last thing I'd say is, if you think about people who come here from all over the planet, who want to become American, yeah. part of the reason we're writing this and part of the reason Calista started her series for four to eight-year-olds is being an American is a historic experience. There's this thing called American. It's not a place, it's not a genetic code, it's not just a set of laws, but it's a way of being. And a lot of that way of being we learned over hundreds of years. And uh, I, I really had a very striking revelation when Calista's second book, which is Land of the Pilgrim's Pride, tries to introduce four to eight-year-olds to colonial America. Now, first of all, we occasionally have a challenge writing fiction, and we write lots of words. She has to write rhyming words in two paragraphs to explain a colony. And it's really, luckily she read a lot of Dr. Zeus when she was a child. I mean, it is really interesting to watch. It's really hard to do. But here's what hit us, is we, because I was helping her and trying to be supportive and being, I was her researcher. And it suddenly hit both of us. Because her mother wrote back and she said, we, we say this is for four to eight year olds, and her mother who's 80, wrote back and said, actually, it's for four to 80-year-olds. And she said, I learned things about the American colonies I didn't know. And what hit us was, we were already Americans in 1775. 
when the British Army marches out and gets involved in the shot heard around the world on April 19th. We were already Americans a year later when we signed the Declaration of Independence. That something had happened and this, this culture that we call America had begun to develop. And I think that's what Bill and I are trying to figure out how to celebrate and how to share with people, uh, both in our Civil War books, our World War II books, our Washington books, to give a, a sense of this is the glory of a country that has shown enormous courage and enormous persistence. And there's no reason to believe that we're any less capable of it today than we were in the 1770s. Best years are yet ahead. Okay, let's open up to questions and answers. We have uh, three members of our staff with microphones. If you have a question, please raise your hand and someone with a microphone will come to it. Please ask one brief question so we can make as much time as we can for questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here and uh, taking the time to uh, invigorate us with the spirit of the history that f helped shape and form this nation. The question I have is res with respect in looking back to the November midterms of 2010, it, it, your comments regarding the impact that truth and factual information had upon the nation to respond, to send so many congressmen to Washington to, to respond to fiscal irresponsibility. That, that to me showed a spirit of pride in the realization of what truth is in view of what uh, vacuum had ruled and gripped us. We're now in the grips of it now. President Lincoln once said, a house divided will not stand. The Republican uh, uh, Party had enjoyed such unity at that time and moved away from that unity to almost implode and tear itself apart. Do you have any comments or uh, viewpoints with respect sure. to I'd, the I'd, dichotomy of such a... No, I, I think sometimes change comes in waves. It's almost like waves breaking on a beach. And I think that we had a wave of effort in 2010 and 11. I think it wasn't uh, led very well. I think it led to confusion in Washington. And I also think it tends to be newer people who come with a new sense of energy and a new sense of enthusiasm and then collide with older people who've been there a while and who are more entrenched in the old order. But I think if the waves keep generating, it's amazing over time. This is why I think the governorships will be one of the places you'll see the change is continuing because the governors are in much closer touch with uh, the real changes of the country at large than our members of the House and Senate. Next question. I have one back here. Welcome to Kansas, Mr. Speaker. Very nice to have you. Uh, thanks very much also for the Conservative Opportunity Society. I remember watching you on C-SPAN and getting me through law school. You, Dick Cheney, Vin Weber, etc and the foresight to take over the Congress in 94. Uh, one quick question, I did want to know uh, what your sense is, what are the challenges for the Republican House and how cohesive will it remain under this administration? I know you've talked about a couple of those issues, but what is your sense of its ability to hold together? Thank you. I, I think that's a very, very important question and I can't give you a forecast. Uh, I've told people, I said this afternoon in the uh, workshop we were in, uh, I think it's very important for the House Republicans to study Tip O'Neill and how he responded to Reagan in 81. Because Tip O'Neill was faced with a president who won a huge victory, much bigger than Obama. Uh, Reagan carried the Republicans into a majority in the Senate. They won six Senate races by a combined total of 75,000 votes. And O'Neill was still the head of a Democratic House. He knew he couldn't stop Reagan, that the country would not have tolerated a stonewalling of a newly elected president. On the other hand, he knew that he couldn't agree with Reagan because Reagan wanted a much more conservative country than O'Neill did. And so he followed a policy of representing the Democratic Party, coming up with their solution, but making in order uh, the president's proposals. So the president had a chance to win uh, we were involved in that pretty intensely, and we had to get one out of every three Democrats to vote with us in order to pass the Reagan tax program in the summer of 81. Uh, I think that Boehner would be very well served to follow the O'Neill strategy. I think if the House Republican leadership 
tries to cut a deal with the president, they will almost inevitably split the party. Because as the president already did yesterday, he, he's going to move to the left. And the more the House Republican leadership tries to accommodate him, the further left he's going to go. And he's going to keep drawing them with him. And I think that will create intolerable tension inside the caucus. But if, but if Boehner says, look, we're willing to cooperate in anything that doesn't violate our principles, and we're going to offer our solution, which we hope you'll accept, but if you won't, we'll make an order your solution. Now, you've got to go get 30 or 35 Republicans to vote with the Democrats. If you do, you'll pass your bill. But if you don't, you can't come to us to ask us as independently elected people to give up our principles to make you happy. Remember, there are two mandates. There's a presidential mandate and a, and a House mandate. It's not like there's only one mandate here. And so I think they've got to be very careful how they approach this because in the end they want to be unified and have a general sense of, of what they stand for going into 14 and 16. Next question. Back. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you talked both about the uh, election in your book about how America is the greatest country in the world. And I'd be curious if, if you would find a distinction between uh, people in America having uh, more opportunities than others in other countries and Americans being somehow higher class citizens than uh, the rest of the world. Yeah, I don't think Americans as individuals are the greatest people in the world. I don't think we're any dramatic. In fact, by definition, since you can come from anywhere to be American, it's not a genetic pattern that says you have to be superior. I mean, you learn to be an American. I think the American culture and the American system are the most powerful system developed for allowing people to pursue happiness and allowing people to develop their ideas. Uh, and in that sense, the system of American exceptionalism really is exceptional. Do you want to comment? An American exceptionalism? <laughs> and, and the nature of the, na of the system being exceptional as opposed to the individuals. The, one of my favorite stories on that, and it's not apocryphal, it's a true story, uh, circulates around Gettysburg. Um, you have these wonderful tour guides, many of them retired Civil War historians and such. And he had a couple from the Orient going around the battlefield. They knew almost as much as he did. And they were asking very pointed questions. And finally, at the end, he said, I, I hope you don't take this wrong, but I'm curious. Uh, why are you guys so interested in the Battle of Gettysburg? And of the couple, one proudly said, we've just become American citizens. We're learning our history. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Newt, I've got a lot of favorite quotes from you, Newt. Uh, some I might not repeat, but. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, one of my favorite quotes from Newton, Newt, Newt points out is that we're not Americans by race, we're not Americans by religion or ethnicity or group. We're Americans because we chose to become Americans or our parents chose for us. Our common connecting point is the Declaration and the Constitution. Interrupt but one generation from connecting to that Constitution and that Declaration in our history and our founding principles. And we've interrupted the concept and the flow, the continuity of what it is to be an American. Okay, next question. Good evening, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just a quick question for you. Uh, let me get a little background. Uh, I spent some time overseas, and uh, whenever I come back, I'm often disgusted at the global community's attacks at American sovereignty. I was trying to get your words on uh, primarily the left's and by extension the Supreme Court's uh, attempts to invalidate the Constitution. I think it's a very major crisis. I think that the, it goes back to, the, if you think about the word exceptionalism, and I do believe there's an American exceptionalism, uh, by definition we are in fact different. Um, we have a whole set of values and systems that are different than the rest of the world. And I, I think the idea that somehow we're going to submerge American rights and submerge the American Constitution uh, on a planet where we're going to pretend that Venezuela and Zimbabwe and Syria and, and, and Uzbekistan are able to outvote us and define the rules, I think is crazy. I'm not picking on those four in particular, but they give you a flavor. Um, and I'm very, very concerned about this. The, the left knows 
they can't change America from within the way they'd like to. So they keep trying, this will come up next with the, with the right to bear arms. They keep trying to figure out United Nations treaties that will force us to change so we can become the country they wish we would be if only we weren't so stubbornly American. And this is a very real tension in our culture uh, and in our political structure. We're going to take one or two more questions. Middle. By one back there. Yep, middle. Mr. Speaker, um, as obvious, in the recent election, it was obvious that most young people um, supported President Obama and many of left-wing politics. What does the Republican Party need to do to relate to the, um, to the younger generation and prepare the next generation coming up of young rep of Republicans? Thank you. Well, this is part of why I want to spend some time thinking and studying. I mean, I, my first answers would be too glib and too shallow. Uh, I would say that we have done a remarkably bad job of communicating with young people and, and recognizing, first of all, that there is an enormous change when you go to college uh, because the American academic faculties are so far to the left. Uh, and that we've been in a long cultural struggle in which we've watched people come to believe things that are fr frankly pretty close to nonsensical. Uh, I was just on a, a radio show with Michael Medved yesterday who was talking about a professor at a college in, in uh, New Jersey who was denying that there was a, that there was a gulag denying that there were mass murders in the Soviet Union, denying that Stalin had ever done anything bad. Now, this guy, you know, you look at that and you think, this is so out of touch with reality, how can this guy get paid to teach in a public school? And yet he was. Uh, and so I think part of it is the environment and the context in which young people are told what's cool. Part of it's the Republican Party that's just, I think, I think way too slow and way too out of, out, of, out of sequence. We aren't in the environments. I, mean, I, I used the example earlier of the Colbert Report or The Daily Show, um, or for slightly older folks, The View. We're not in the habit of competing. We're not even communicating. I mean, if you were to go back and look on, on the case of Latino Americans, go look at when the Obama team started advertising in Univision and Telemundo, and look at when Romney did. Well, I mean, if you're not there, and you're not saying anything, and you have no message, why should it surprise you that nobody showed up? Uh, every college Republican group ought to be taking two or three issues, one of which ought to be the right to have a personal Social Security savings account, and, and communicating with younger Americans because it is in their self-interest. I, I think if the president, by the way, I think this will change pretty dramatically if we have two or three more years of bad economy. Uh, this year, by 58 to 38, the country blamed Bush more than Obama. I'm not sure you can carry that out for another three or four years if the economy stays bad. And I have a hunch that an unemployed college graduate may be dramatically more conservative than a college student on a student loan program. Uh, and, and that you may see a very substantial shift to the right as people confront economic reality. Okay, Mr. Speaker, Bill, thank you much for a great program tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I should, and I should make one, one brief commercial. If you do get Callista's books, I have some book plates that she signed. So we can put, they're great uh, for little kids. And I, my commercial is that this is the book, Victory at Yorktown. Uh, we've got plenty of copies of it, I think. Uh, both authors are going to sign it. Unique opportunity to get that. So if you want to grab a copy of it, get it signed, just queue up back at the back of Hanson. And thank you all so much for coming out tonight. This would be a great Christmas present, by the way. I'm going to pick up five. So <laughs> go for it, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Can we go down and over?